And let's roll back to leasing for a moment. Um, because I think there was different flavors of centralized leasing. And I, I, I'm wondering if you can kind of share with the audience what those look like. P pretend for a moment that, you know, you, what you're, you're, I would like you to deliver to the listeners different strategies that you have seen deployed on the automated uh, sort of the centralized leasing. Because I, I think on one of the spectrum, you have, I've got access controls everywhere. You know, I can give access completely remotely. Nobody ever needs to show up. But not every, but very, in fact, I would argue probably very few people, very few properties have that capacity. So, so what are people doing from what's, what's reasonable to, if you want to dip a toe in the water to what have you seen that's most efficient and what's like uh, aspirational at this point? So um, if, if I think about the, like if I, if I think about the, the sort of evolutionary, you know, we're going to improve the process and, and, and look you know, just take these incremental steps, each of which pays for itself, you know, that kind of that kind of process. One of, one of the most palatable and, and effective next steps that I've seen is when you is when you create a central capability for like lead nurturing, right? So somebody maybe you're using uh, one of these AI apps, which are increasingly common right now to just handle uh, to handle inbound calls and they're going to handle a lot of the the conversation from initial call through to um you know through to close um you also you you, know, you, you might augment that with some call center or some regionalized leasing um capability where humans are going to reach out proactively to 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 you know nurture leads that that came to the property um i've seen people make that work in a, in a relatively low tech um environment um, if I, if you were then going to improve that still further, you're looking at something like um, you know, one of the CRMs. Uh, there are only two of them that have a that, that are structured around the um, uh, that are structured around the uh, the individual, like the prospect, rather than around the building. It's one of the big flaws in nearly all of the CRM technology <clears throat> in the um, in the industry. If uh, if Daniel goes to property A and property B, then there's a you know, there's a guest card at property A for Daniel and the guest card at property B and never the twain shall, shall meet, right? Now now you've got, Daniel has a, has a card and we now know which properties that he's gone to, to, to look at. So you imagine if you combine sort of a, a more centralized or regionalized set of resources who are, who, who are really focused on, you know, on, on nurturing with a much more complete view of, uh, of who's coming to their, to their properties and, uh, what we might proactively offer them, for example, you can see how that's an improvement. That that then makes you much better at dealing with problems like, well, there are no two beds in this property that he really likes, but you know, what about you know, we have a two bed at this other one and it's not that far away. I, I mean, I, I, I've heard so, so I've heard companies. Um, in, in fact, in the twenty for twenty interviews, I, I, I heard examples of companies where their their properties are really nowhere near each other. You can't put a leasing agent in a car to drive from one property to another. It would waste waste too much time. So they've they've kept um, leasing agents in their properties. They're, they're really nice sort of uh, a, a class properties um, anyway. Uh, but they said that since they started um, you know, lead sharing, right? So that that use case that I just talked about, where you know I'm going to I'm going to refer you to a different one of my uh, sister properties. Something like it was something like eighteen percent, one eight percent of the um, uh, of of their new leads came uh, started their search at a different property. So there's there's good reason to believe that that there's an efficiency to be had just by uh, just by by doing it that way. Um, you know, from from there you've got the model where you know the, 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 if I if I think of someone like a Camden, um, interestingly they viewed access control as being really pivotal to the um to the self tour experience that they want to do they they created a really cool um touring app as well like they've uh, they, they they custom built so they built their own um access control they built their own um <clears throat> uh, touring app on top of it and they they've they've added some very cool like bits of experience um into that so that you know you, you can very much rent without uh, meeting anybody right so the uh you know they have sort of full lead sharing capabilities they have it's ai enabled so so they can handle way more calls than they uh, than they used to or, or or conversations than they used to you 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 don't even have to download an app you get an email sent to you you click through this they have all this native functionality in the browser 
you walk into a property and it works with their access control and you, you've got this very slick like end-to-end -end experience so that that's probably at the the kind of like aspirational uh, end of the uh, end of the spectrum U udl would be another similar company that's done similar things but that i mean that that sort of gives you a sense of the range is it your guess would you guess that if you took out the it, it, it's non-trivial to retrofit a property with access controls. It's non-trivial. And um, Camden built their own, which is interesting, uh, kind of tour app. Those apps and other from other providers are not yet quite mature and ready for that experience. To, but, but presuming that those two things were both accessible in some fashion, you could finance all of your access control and make it work with your P&L. Um, is that... Do you feel that is the natural desti destination for everyone in the industry? Is that really how things should be run if you could? Or I'll just leave it there. Is that is that where we're all gravitating towards eventually? Yeah, that's, that's a super interesting question. I, I, I think that's indicative of the general level of uh, the direction of, of travel because th this stuff gets more affordable over time. Um, obviously, as more new properties um, get built, uh, of which there are a great deal coming to market uh, this year. But as, as more stuff gets built, you're, you're generally going to, to put the, the IoT like backbone into the place. So over time, that's the general direction. But I, I often talk about this. So, so I was here in Houston, like a, God, about a, a year ago, having lunch with a, an owner. And um, we went and toured one of his properties afterwards. It's like really lovely property, like really close to where I live here in, 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 in the Montrose district of, uh, of Houston. Uh, and it's great, you know, he, 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 we were going around, he was telling me every detail of, of this build out, the design and everything that we, that we looked at. And, uh, and as I was walking around, I just sort of noticed Okay, this this has a bit of a hotel feel to it, and you know, we were greeted by you know, there were a couple of staff members there. We were greeted by somebody, and it just felt like a really nice place to be. And I, I was just thinking, if you took all the staff out of here, that would not improve this um, this property. <laughs> it would, um, you know, it, it feels like you because you could see there were people sitting in the lobby doing work. There were people meeting for coffee, and it was it was just sort of nice. It was a, a really nice amenity. I would I would pay more money to live somewhere like that. And I just thought if you if you made it so that we got rid of the people and you just text some AI, um, I, I don't think people would like it that much more. So, so again, I, I I think you you need to have you, the the nicer the property is, I think the more you need to have somebody that does leasing, whether that means you have a full time leasing agent or whether you you strip out more and more of the admin and and make the, the staff who are there more sales focused. Um, I I. I so, so I, I feel like it's not it's not really an all or nothing kind of thing, but I feel you can get sort of most of the way there with um, with the, the technology that's out there. Uh, by the way, I completely agree on um, uh, on uh, tour solutions. I, that that feels like a very unsettled area of uh, of technology and process in the industry so far. Hard to get focused on building. A, speaking from somebody who runs a software company, hard to get focused on building a tool like that when when the industry is not quite ready. Um, but uh, but I think I think what you're saying sounds right. There is some there is some point of inflection where uh, you have people that are mostly and, and, and we can say solidly everyone looking for a class C apartment is in this category. People that are mostly just price sensitive They're They don't need to be sold on the community and they, like they want to find a, an affordable place to live and they really don't need you to sell them on it. If your price is right, location is right, like they're fine. Those people could tour all on their own, be fine. Then there's some inflection point where people like. This is a big enough investment for me. The community manages matters enough to me that I want to have a, a an experience with the person to sell me on that this is the place where where I should be living. I have choice. I have. I'm not so price constrained. So somewhere in there is this inflection point. But um, um, the thing is that, that the, all the research shows that you know the the Gen Z and millennials like. They're not so they're not so keen on dealing with people. Like they might we might find they actually even for the class A stuff would be just perfectly happy talking to, you know, their the avatar on their phone saying, Yeah, open this door and tell me about this and letting an AI say what it needs to say about it. Uh, but we're not there yet. Yeah, it's a, well, it's, it's it's funny, isn't it? Because when, I, I remember one of the most interesting things about twenty twenty one, like uh, after the lockdowns had had, had stopped, was the you went from, you know, it's, it's funny, in earlier editions of 20 for 20, we were writing about how 
how reticent the industry was about self-guided tours because it, it had worked in single family for a really long time but in, in in multi-family everyone was like oh what if somebody falls down the stairs what if someone steals something what if blah 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 like the pe- pe- people didn't want to do it and then covid came along and, and suddenly everything was self-guided right it's low tech but it, it tours were, were all self-guided but then in 2021 and so, so it, it felt like we've ripped the band-aid off right uh, everyone everyone everything's now going to be self-show and in 2021 it, it Everybody seemed to be saying that if you offer people a choice between self-guided and in-person tours, they were cho- they were choosing in-person. Now, the, the 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 theory was that people just wanted to go back to people experiences because they'd been in lockdown for so much of 2020. Um, so, so again, I, I I don't I don't know how persistent that 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 sort of desire to have some interaction with with people um, will be. I, I I'd like I'd like to think people like it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I agree. The and and I, I I've also heard that when people uh, when people have compared the closing ratios between tours and and that are guided, not gui- self guided, that the the self guided are closing at a much lower rate, which is problematic. I know somebody from my well, I won't mention the the client, uh, but somebody I was talking to the other day said they had retracted a little bit because of uh, of that. Um, so maybe the process isn't right, or maybe it will always be worse. I, I don't know, but um, I think that as you described the different iterations, the first a couple that you mentioned seem like table stakes, no brainer. Like you should not have a person answering the phone and setting appointments these days. That can be very well handled by some very capable AI vendors in our in our industry. Um, the other stuff is a little more uh, you're you're forging uh, you know your own path. Now let's talk to maintenance about maintenance for a moment because maintenance, I, I got very frustrated um, with, when people were like, Oh, maintenance is going to be like people started talking. So yeah, as you know, I have this other hat I wear when I'm not a professor here at the department Academy running Leonardo 24 seven. And, um, and there was this period of time where people started saying, well, are you handling centralization? How are you handling centralization? And the question, well, what do you really want to do? Well, we want to think about maintenance centralization. And what my, you know, my take on it has always been that there is only a very thin margin of operators in the country who have enough critical mass of assets in any given metropolitan area that you can really share maintenance people effectively. Once the maintenance person has to drive an hour, like that's it. You have lost all of the, uh, the, um, uh, efficiencies that you might gain from a centralized pod, but talk, talk a little about that. Dom, am I, am I off base? Is there actually more of that out there than I think? Um, or is there another alternative when people think about centralizing maintenance? Yeah, so, so a couple of things that I would share on, um, uh, on, on maintenance centralization. The, the, the penny drops on this for, for me while, while I was doing this year's um, research. Um, so there's a lot of talk of changing the 1 to 100 ratio. That's, that's the thing, you know, one staff member per 100, um, per 100 units. And if, if you're... If you're centralizing, if you're serious about centralizing uh, either or both of leasing or admin, at the very least, it's one of the main benefits you're looking for. And it's often the main driver of the initiative is that you're trying to go from, you know, three people to two people on site, right? You're, you're trying to change that ratio of one to 100 um, units. I don't think anybody who I've spoken to who's making any headway on maintenance is doing it in service of breaking the one to 100 ratio in maintenance. I, I don't think that's where the money is um, for people that are actually making progress on it. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, people, it, it's really hard to be fully staffed in a lot of places on, on maintenance. So, so again, my, my problem is is much more like, how do I not be exposed to that problem that I, I'm, I'm always a bit short on staff? Like that that's a, a more accurate statement of the problem than, I want to go from from three maintenance to two maintenance on on, on property. That, 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 I, I think that's an important distinction that I, I think people miss. But the, the other thing though is when, when you talk to people, I mean, I mean maintenance centralization to me looks like looks like you have your maintenance all of your maintenance people report into a regional head of maintenance, right? Instead of having them report into community managers. The benefit is that you then get to view your resources as a as a sort of pool. Uh, and what people tell me is that the way it pays for itself or the way you make money out of this is that 
you, know, you hire, in, instead of just having three generalists at each property, maybe you hire one appliance specialist. Well, if you hire an appliance specialist as one of your maintenance resources in your, in your pool, you never see another external invoice for, a maintenance, uh, for an appliance repair. So you know you're you're saving this money. I mean you're saving the money five or six hundred dollars at a time, but that those savings mount up over a, over a cluster of uh, of properties. Um, and it, it sounded like there, there, there was one really good company that they sort of kind of been forced into it because they had a lot of sub one hundred unit stuff and it was all close together, and so the the on premise model doesn't work as well. So they they they'd had to sort of figure out some some more kind of creative stuff. But um, they were saying that it's it's like once you make that change to the way that you organize, it's like this ratchet that um, where you keep identifying, well, maybe, maybe we're doing enough painting, but if we just, one of these people is a painter, then we just send them to like do, do, do paint around the, uh, around the properties. HVAC is a, uh, is a similar thing. But also if, if, you're, if everyone's reporting into like a regional head of, of maintenance, they know that there's somebody in that property who can fix that problem in that other property. So they just task them with with doing that. Rather, again, rather than getting some external vendor to, to come in, which, which is what uh, frequently happens normally. So, so, the, so it seems to me the reasons that people uh, look to centralize maintenance are to have more flexibility, to have more ways to give people a, a, some career progression. So you, you get less attrition than you uh, th than you normally do, to be less exposed to to staff shortages, and just to stop spending money when you don't need to. So that under that model then, Don, which makes more sense to me, you it's not as if you have a pod and people are getting dispersed from the pod that day and then going to the next, like I've got to fix the toilet over here and then I'm going to go fix the doorbell over here. It's like I'm the painter and I'm going to be at this property today and I'll be at this property tomorrow and I'm the appliance guy and I'll be here today and I'll be there tomorrow. That's the model that, that seems to work. Mm -hmm. Um. Is there any, do you have any sense if you were kind of like, it's kind of eyeball it in order for that to work and be effective, how many units you need in any sort of given MSA for, to be able to pull that off? Um, I don't know, but I, I, I think given it, it's a very sort of, it's, it's quite, it's a very sort of low tech uh, approach. Like you don't need to change your, your tech stack in the, in the way that you would with, with, you know, with the other two leasing and, and admin usually entails. You need you need different technology to to, to do those. The, the, you don't really you, you know, as, as long as somebody has access to all of the work orders and the systems that you use to to process them. You don't you don't need to change much about that. It's more of an organizational change. So you know even if you had three properties like and you and you pulled the resources between between them, you could you could start to be better at some um, uh, at, uh, at some of this uh, at some of this stuff without uh, without changing too much else. And it seems to me that yeah, you, you then just start seeing the the opportunities um, as they uh, uh, as they arise because you're you're looking at different stuff than you otherwise would be. So so you don't need some uh, exotic workforce management solution to pull this off. You simply need to know what specialties you have in house, and then some way to assign work orders to each of them based on that speciality. No, yeah, I don't, I don't think you. Uh, I don't think you do. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there will be there. there are, there are different and uh, and exciting um, technologies out there, but I I don't think any of this is contingent on on going out and, and buying any, any any shiny objects. Yeah, or me building one, which is good. That's that's a relief. Thank you. <laughs> um, do you, by the way, uh, Dom? Do you consult with companies to help them make some of these decisions? Well, no. I, so, so I my my model is it's it's tech vendors that that. That tend to, to hire me. Um, uh, my my business is very is very dependent on having lots and lots of experts in the industry who answer the phone when I call them. And I I've, I've found it works a lot better if you are uh, if you're not trying to make money from the uh, from the people who you also want to get the expertise from. So no no I, I mostly work with uh, with technology companies in one way or another and uh, and, and spend most of my time talking to uh, uh, talking to owners and operators about their stuff. <laughs> Got it. So talk a little bit about that. Let's if if you're a vendor, um, what 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 does that engagement normally look like? What 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 if vendors come to you to say, look, I, Dom, you you know, you've got all this experience. What tell help me to understand what 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 service do you provide to those folks so we can point them in your direction? So so it's nearly always 
um, a technology vendor that is is trying to do some uh, solve a problem in a different way from the rest of the market. Um, I I tend to advise them on like I, I basically figure out what the the best um, you know, differentiators are for their for their products, like what what things we think motivate people to buy their product versus the other uh, competing products in the market. Um, when you have a big Rolodex of contacts, what one of the best things that you can do is you, you, you're usually good at figuring out who's likely to say no to this technology. So you call them and ask them, <laughs> ask them why they would say no to it. And that then gives you a much clearer picture of, uh, all right, which of these things are, which, which of these things sound nice versus which of these things do we think actually move the, uh, the needle and who do we think this is likely to play uh, the best with. I, I tend to do research for them and I publish a lot of, uh, a lot of white papers. Um, but again, I, I, I tend to only publish stuff if it's true thought leadership. It has to be, it has to be something different, like that, that presents a different viewpoint from what's out there in the industry um, already. And so, yeah, I just, uh, I just have a bunch of uh, partnerships of one sort or, or another with, um, with companies that ask me to do stuff like that. Cool. Very cool. Um, uh, maybe I should have consulted you years ago, Dom. Is there, uh, but if people are interested in getting in touch with you, how, what's the best way to reach you? I mean, just come to 20for20.com, so 20for20.com, uh, or I'm pretty active on, um, on, on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm not hard to find. Yeah, right. If you're paying attention, you will find, uh, you will find Dom in your inbox sooner or later. Um, well, thank you for coming on here today and, and, um, and lecturing here at, at the, uh, the apartment Academy. This was, uh, some good stuff. And, um, we didn't even touch on some of the juicier things that you, that you were like, what's happening with AI and all, I mean, that's really, really interesting. Um, but for another time, uh, I appreciate you coming on today. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. I'll see you at the next trade show. No doubt. Yeah, no, no absolutely. Probably in Philly, huh? Yeah, definitely on Philly. Hopefully. Hopefully it's going to be a good show. I'll see you there. Thanks. Thank you for joining us at this week's episode of the Apartment Academy podcast. The Apartment Academy is a production of Leonardo 24-7, the industry's leader in multifamily operations and maintenance software. At Apartment Academy, we realize the hard work that goes into property management and the stress that comes along with it. Leonardo 24-7 takes the guesswork out of your team's day-to-day by providing customized daily guidance on tasks that need to be done, guaranteeing consistent operations across your entire portfolio. To learn more, visit www.leonardo247.com today.